Welcome. We're continuing our awesome message series called Better Than Before. It's based on 2 Corinthians 3.18, which we've been reciting together during announcements, memorizing, hopefully. Uh, It just says that as believers, um, we're being transformed into the image of Jesus by the power of God. What an amazing concept that that's what it means by being made better than before. Uh, and anybody need to be made better than before? <laughs> Should I pick up two hands here? Um, so I hope you've been enjoying the amazing Bible stories of different people from history, from Scripture. Uh, this week we're going to look at the transformation of David. Um, I have to say that there is... Uh, his life, his story is way too big to try to cover all of it. Um, did you know David's name is mentioned over 900 times in the Bible? Actually, I think it's 920 times, which is more than anyone else, any other name in the Bible besides God and Jesus. So um, this week, we're going to be looking at um, two different, well, I'm going to take two weeks on David just because there's so much there. It's really big. This week, we're going to look at kind of the early part of his life, the first half of his life, and his transformation journey from being a shepherd to being a king. Next week, we're going to look at some uh, specific events that happened while he was king. So the story of David begins in 1 Samuel chapter 16, if you want to open your Bibles there or or tap on your Bible app and, and find it. it. It sometimes helps me if I follow along with what we're looking at. But um, so 1 Samuel 16, uh, if you want to get a little background before we dive into that, um, Samuel, the guy who this book that we're looking at was named after, was a prophet, and he was the last of the uh, judges that ruled over Israel from the time uh, they entered into the promised land until they started having a king. They actually demanded a king. They wanted a king. So Samuel uh, ended up anointing a guy named Saul. He was the first king of Israel. Uh, But he kind of turned away from God and started doing his own thing. Uh, He knew what was right. He decided not to do it. So God rejected him and told him, that uh, basically you're done. It didn't happen immediately, but uh, God did reject him as king. And he actually told Samuel to go to Bethlehem and to find a guy named Jesse and that God would show him which of Jesse's sons were going to be the next king. Uh, So let's pick up the story there. Uh, Chapter 16, verse 6. This is... Samuel basically inspecting uh, Jesse's sons. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, and Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So then then he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and he had him brought in and he was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So God, we lift up this passage of scripture, uh, these many sections of scripture that we're going to be covering today, and we ask that you would give us ears to hear what your Holy Spirit is saying to us, God. There are some powerful truths that are woven into this story, God, and help us to not only think of them as historical, 
not only think of them as things that happened, though they certainly are that, um, but to see them as lessons, things that we can apply to our lo- own life and, and adjust the way we think, adjust the way we see things, adjust the way we see you where necessary. That only happens when the presence of your spirit is here. So, Lord, we invite your spirit to come. If that's your prayer, say amen. So we don't really know exactly how old David was when Samuel anointed him, but we do have some pretty good indicators and clues. Uh, We can say pretty confidently that he was no more than 15 years old at the most, and he could have been as young as 10 years old when when this happened. Uh, But he didn't actually become king until he was 30. And we know that precisely because his age was recorded. So there was a period of about 10 to 15 years uh, where uh, he was told that he was going to be king, but yet he hadn't taken the throne yet. And uh, there's a lot that happened in that period. That's what we're going to be looking at this week, uh, the transformation of David from shepherd to king. Uh, Now, obviously, the beginning of that journey started when the spiritual leader of the nation kind of shows up at his house and goes, you know, guess what? God has chosen you as king. Can you imagine being that young and, uh, you know, being told that? I can't even imagine what that must have felt like. But in any case, um, something really interesting happened when Samuel anointed David. It says the Holy Spirit came upon him powerfully. Yet the very next verse says that the Spirit departed from Saul. So you see what's happening here? There was a a switching of God's anointing from Saul to David. And it says that Saul had an evil spirit. Once the Holy Spirit left him, an evil spirit came and was tormenting him. And it was actually that tormenting that uh, led to Saul coming into contact uh, with David because his his advisors, his people were like, hey, let's find a really good musician to come in here and play music when this evil spirit comes and maybe it'll help you feel better. So one of them knew about David and that he was a good guitar player. He, it actually says he played the lyre, which is a pre-guitar instrument. It's what evolved into the guitar. Uh, so they called David. He came in, played some guitar for him, and sure enough, uh, Saul felt a lot better. The evil spirit would leave Saul as David played, and it was more than just because uh, David was a good guitar player. The Holy Spirit was on him. David was a worship leader. And, you know, the spirit, the enemy can't stand worship. I don't know about you, but, you know, when I feel like I'm under it, um, I just put some worship music on and just feels like it kind of clears the room. Not superstitious. I'm just telling you what what happens. So, anyway... Saul really liked David. He was like, yeah, that's awesome. Um, That's how he came into contact with Saul. And at this point, David is still kind of going back and forth between his dad's house and Saul's place uh, because he had responsibilities as a shepherd, the family business. But then something happened that really changed everything in a drastic way for David. The Israelites had an enemy called the Philistines. And the Philistines were gathering on a hill getting ready to attack um, Israel. So Saul gathered his army uh, and they met on an opposing hill. So the Israelites are over here, the Philistines are over here. uh, But the Philistines had a weapon of mass destruction called Goliath. He was a nine foot, nine inch tall, giant, trained killer. He was a warrior. And back then, the size of a person made a big difference because there wasn't any guns to kind of equalize it or, 
you know, bombs or anything like that. They had swords. It says that Goliath's spear, the, the head of his spear was 15 pounds. <laughs> That's a big spear. His javelin was like a, I think it says a weaver's rod, whatever that is. But uh, every day for over a month, Goliath would come out and he would kind of taunt the Israelites. And he would say, look, pick the best, strongest warrior you have and send him out here to fight me. If he can kill me, we'll all be your servants. But if I kill him, then you guys have to be our servants. But the Israelites were terrified. They're like, nobody wanted to do that because nine foot nine, you know? I mean, that's like Sita standing on Isaac's shoulders. <laughs> and then some. To give you an idea, um, not over the stage, but the ceiling there is nine feet tall. Think about that when you stand up, look up. He was nine feet or nine inches past the ceiling. That's how big this guy was. So one day David's dad uh, sent him to the front line to bring some food to his brothers and just to check on them, see if they were okay, if they were still alive, you know, stuff like that. Uh, when David got there, he heard what Goliath was saying. He heard his taunts. He heard him kind of defying God. And uh, he was indignant. And he's like, what will the king do for the man that goes and kills this guy? I'm not afraid of him. Now, keep in mind, David's a teenager still at this point. He's just a kid. And when uh, David's brother heard what he was saying, he got really upset with him. I'll actually come back to that. But the people who heard what he was saying, they were like, okay, let's bring him to Saul. So they brought him to Saul. Um, Saul was like, look, I'll go fight this guy. But David said that to Saul. Saul was like, you're just a kid. You know, this guy has been uh, a warrior since his youth. He's well-trained. He's a, he's a killing machine. But David's like, look, I'm a shepherd and when I've been out in the field, I have faced both a lion and a bear, and I killed them. I killed them both, and I'll do the same thing to this guy. Remember, the Spirit of God is on David, right? So Saul's like, all right. <laughs> Tries to put his armor on him. Saul was a really big guy, so you can imagine David as a teenager and as kind of a short person putting this stuff on. He's going, look, I can't, I can't fight in this stuff. So he took it all off and he just gathered a few stones and his slingshot and he went out there to meet Goliath. And he says to Goliath, you know, you come to me with your weapons, your spear and your javelin, and, and, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. And they shared some threats. And something so powerful happened. I just love this. It inspires me. David just ran towards Goliath. He ran towards him. He took a stone, put it in his slingshot, and he goes, Whew! and the stone goes, plunk. And it says it hit him in the forehead. It actually sunk into his forehead. And this giant tower of a man fell face forward. And David killed their giant champion by the power of God. And that changed everything for David. <laughs> for one thing, Saul's like, yeah, you're not going home anymore. You, you need to start living here. Uh, he put him, he gave him a high rank in the military. Um, and uh, everything that David did was incredibly successful. Every battle he fought, he won. One day, actually, I think it was right after he killed Goliath, he was heading into town, and the women wrote a song about him. The song actually became famous because later we see that even the enemies know about this song. And what the women were singing is, Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. So you can imagine Saul's ego didn't really appreciate that. You know, that makes David... 10 times better, and uh, 
from that day forward, Saul began to be very suspicious and threatened by David. He was afraid of him. It says he was afraid of him because the Holy Spirit had left him, but it was on David. So the next day, Saul tried to kill David. The first time of many attempts, he tried to kill David. And that was the beginning of kind of a bizarre cycle between the two of them where Saul would be fine, they would be kind of near each other, then he would try to kill David and David would try to run. For the most part, Saul spent an incredible amount of time and energy chasing David around, trying to kill him. But David didn't retaliate. Remember, he's a warrior, you know. Saul's tall, but he's not as tall as Goliath. He could have he could have ended Saul if he wanted to, but he wouldn't. And he wouldn't because of his fear of the Lord. In fact, two separate occasions, uh, David had the opportunity. He was close enough that he could have killed him right then and there. The first time, they were in a cave, and Saul didn't know it, but David was hiding in the cave, and he cut a piece of his robe off, but didn't kill him. The second time, Saul was sleeping. David snuck up there took the spear and, and jug of water next to his head. And both times David went, presented those things and went, look, Saul, I could have killed you. You're saying I want to kill you and that's why you're trying to kill me, but I could, I had the chance. I didn't do it. And both times Saul relented. He backed off and he was, he was sorry. He even said, you know, David, you're a better man than I am. And I know that you're going to be king someday. Thankfully, after that seven, uh, second I incident, um, Saul kind of let up and stopped pursuing David. I think part of that was because David moved uh, into enemy territory. So Saul kind of left him alone for a year and four months. A year and four months later, according to a prophecy against Saul, he ended up committing suicide in the middle of a battle where the enemy was going to capture him and he didn't want to be captured because he knew what they would do to him. So he committed suicide. Shortly after that, David became king of Judah, uh, but not for seven and a half more years did he become king of all of Israel, all the tribes. Uh, and then that's a long story that we don't have time to go into, but like we've been doing throughout this series, I just want to take time to explore David's formation, his transformation, and his gratification, meaning his, his fulfillment of God's calling on his life. Here's some of the things we know about David's formation. We know that his family, including him, uh, were followers of God. We know that they were shepherds. That was David's vocation, uh, which means he learned to take responsibility for things at a very young age. Uh, we know that he was brave, incredibly brave. He had no problem facing a lion and a bear. Uh, so he took care of those animals at the risk to himself. We know that he was really young when Samuel anointed him. Uh, and we know that a lot of his formation, his preparation to be king, happened after uh, Samuel anointed him to be king, that 15 or 20 years that we talked about. And we should really consider how hard that must have been for David to be chased around for that long by a king that was trying to kill you. That would be a miserable life, wouldn't it? And all of that for no good reason, because David was good to Saul. He was very loyal. So let that be an encouragement to you when you experience trials of many kinds in this life. You know, those things expand. Like, we spend so much time and effort trying to avoid discomfort and pain and suffering. And I'm not saying we should embrace it, but I'm just going... They result in good. They ex that, those things expand our capacity to deal with stuff. Christians 
of all people should not be wimps. You know what I mean? We should run towards our trouble when God is with us. So David had to grow up pretty fast and uh, God used those things to facilitate his transformation. Think about it. He went from taking care of sheep to taking care of people. Saul put him over a thousand soldiers. He's still a kid. And we know when he was running away from Saul, he had uh, this kind of ragtag group of of guys that, that came to him. So he was taking care of 600 guys and their families. So that's probably more than a thousand people that he had to care for. And I'm sure that that had to help prepare him for leading the nation. That was part of his transformation. And once again, we see how greatness is forged in the fire of hardship. Come on. Greatness is forged in the fire of hardship. I can tell you even in my own life, from personal experience, uh, a lot of the things I've learned about leadership is by watching other leaders and going, don't do that, (laughs) you know? I've learned how to lead by learning what not to do. Uh, Of course, I've learned a lot of good things from good godly leaders too. Um, But I can just picture David going, look, when when I'm king, just remind me to not do the stupid things that Saul is doing. There is a a kind of important proviso or caveat to this. Um, Transformation from these difficult circumstances only takes place when we stay connected to the vine, right? We have to walk in the spirit when hard things happen or they'll just be hard things. If we want good things to come from hard things, We have to walk with the Lord. We have to be obedient to the Lord. I know that's like a four-letter word in our culture, obedient. I'm not obedient to anyone. Okay, let me know how that goes for you. Because if we don't do that, then suffering is just suffering. Nothing good comes from it. Listen, God brings purpose from our pain. God brings purpose from pain. And he brings gratification and exaltation. David gratified many of God's purposes uh, through his obedience. Uh, He delivered Israel from Goliath, from the Philistines, from the Amalekites, from many other enemies. Uh, But Probably the most important thing is, and really take a second to consider this. David solidified a nation that would carry the name of God through history and to the whole world. David's obedience brought God to the world. You know, Israel is like this island in a sea of enemies in the Middle East. You know, and I know that's a complex uh, topic, but um, I can't even imagine where we would be without Israel and without people like David and without David. God used his obedience to work his will in the world, right? God will use your obedience to work his will in the world. Critical. And the rewards go beyond this world, don't they? But they also happen in this world. David was exalted as a king. You know, I think just about everybody knows who David is. 
Everybody knows the story of David and Goliath, even atheists. Because he was an extraordinary man, wasn't he? So I want to spend the rest of our time looking at some of David's, I, I know we've mentioned these, but I, I want to drill down deeper into some of David's uh, extraordinary attributes. First of all, David was crazy brave. <laughs> Come on. He was crazy brave. You know, to run towards a fierce nine foot nine giant champion warrior uh, with nothing but a slingshot when you're a kid. That's crazy brave, isn't it? <laughs> He's a teenager. Come on. Of course, teenagers usually are more likely to do stupid things, but <laughs> it wasn't a stupid thing if God is with you. Now, maybe you think about that. You go, yeah, that's just not me. I, I, I hate confrontation. I can't even face my boss boss when it comes time for reviews <laughs> or whatever, you know. But, you know, I think a lot of people think incorrectly about bravery. Listen, bravery isn't a lack of fear when you face difficult things or even terrifying things. It's not, it's, it's not a lack of fear. Bravery is when we have the courage to face that fear. Bravery is when we act with courage despite the fear. That's real courage. Like, what do you even need courage for if it's not scary? We can face our fears and even run towards them if God is with us and if we know God is with us. If you really believe God is with you, you're going to run towards him. Not him. Well, yeah, him. But, you know, you're going to face your fears. Ah, I'm going late, but I really want to tell this story. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So when I was, I don't even know how old I was, probably 10 years old, and uh, I had this recurring dream all through my childhood. Um, that I would go down into the basement of the house I grew up in and there was this fox or a witch. And it kind of, you know, it was always the same dream, but it switched between a fox and a witch. But the fox was evil looking and I don't have to tell you what the witch looked like. I mean, it was terrifying as a little kid, you know, and I would have this dream over and over and over. And, uh, and I just had a lot of fear. Well, I was probably 10 years old and I went, I can't live like this. So I shut the lights off in the basement and I went down there in these rafters where I saw this. And I went, if you're there, do it. If you're there, do it now because I'm not gonna live my life in fear. And I never had that dream again. I ran toward it. Something powerful happened in me, and if you know me now, uh, fear's not one of my attributes. But the Holy Spirit overcame that fear. The Holy Spirit in me overcame that fear. Bravery is when we act with courage despite what we feel. Come on, somebody. David also experienced prejudice. Maybe you never thought of that. Do you ever wonder why is it when Samuel came that, that Jesse didn't bring David to? I know a lot of people think, well, it's because he was young. But, you know, to me, it appears that there was more than just that. There was more just that. So another clue is how his brothers treated him. In chapter 17, his older brother uh, called him conceited and wicked just because he was willing to stand up to Goliath. Conceited and wicked just because he was brave. So he treated David with contempt. I mean, it's clear if you read it, it's like very contemptuous. 
Uh, it kind of reminds me of Joseph and how his brothers treated him, remember? Now, I believe that David was tra- treated this way because he didn't fit the stereotypical uh, kind of accepted profile of a leader. And I have evidence for, for that belief. Here's why I believe that. Earlier in Samuel, we see that Saul was handsome as anyone in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. So that was the first king of Israel. And if you read that story, it seems clear that, you know, they admired that he was tall and that he was, you know. And of course, you know, he, kings were warriors, so there was some value to it. But it's still like that today, isn't it? Appearance and even being tall is, you get preferential treatment if you're good looking. This is true. I've, I saw a documentary on this where the same person with the exact same uh, resume went and applied for a job. Then they put on a fat suit and made him ugly. They went in, all the, all, the only thing that changed was their name. And vastly, they chose the good looking tall people over the ugly fat whatever people. That's how it is. Sorry, people are laughing. Should I not use the word fat? I mean, fat is fat, you know. I've been fat. No shame attached. Look, I'm short. That doesn't offend me. I didn't even know I was short until I was like 16. I always thought I was bigger. Somebody went... You know you're actually short, right? <laughs> what? <laughs> Get a ruler. <laughs> anyway. No, I'm 5'8". Average height is 5'9". Um, so I'm not terribly short, but I'm short. Um, and I have literally experienced this. One time I was in charge at a church over these whole, all this stuff, and uh, one of our trucks started on fire. And, you know, me and one of the other pastors showed up uh, and, you know, I'm engaging, trying to engage the firemen to see, find out what happened. Uh, But my friend who actually worked for me, and he's like probably 6'5", was standing next to me and all the firemen were tall and they kept talking to him. And he's going, um, he's in charge. Even after he said that, they kept looking to him. They would not look at me and talk to me. So they would ask him a question, and my friend would go, what do you want to do? And I would ask, and he would tell them. (laughs) It's like, (laughs) what the heck? I'm I'm not so short that you can't see me. (laughs) I'm not saying that, you know, we should, you know, shame tall people or somehow treat them worse because they're tall. You know, David was actually handsome. It said he was handsome. God didn't reject him because he was handsome. The point is he didn't pick him because he was handsome, right? I want to point this out. This is what God himself said to Samuel when, when he was interviewing or, you know, checking out, inspecting Jesse's son. The first, they would go oldest to the youngest. So they started with Eliab, um, who was tall and handsome, by the way. You'll see that in this text. Um, so, and we've already looked at this. Let's look at it again. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely, surely the Lord's anointed stands before the Lord. But the Lord said to, the Lord himself said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. Don't think about how tall he is, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Come on. Prejudice of every kind is not of God. God looks at the heart. It doesn't matter how big you are. It doesn't matter what color you are. What matters is your heart. So listen, if you've been passed over, if you've been overlooked and treated bad because you're not that good looking or because you're 
not tall enough or not skinny enough or not whatever, you're in good company. And probably in some ways, it happens to everyone because people, when they're not aligned with God, are stupid. God makes us good. Oh, you know, morality, yada, yada, yada. Well, you're going to care about morality when that morality is used against you. Right? Come on. God sees the heart. If you follow him, that's what qualifies you for the kingdom. That's what qualifies you for leadership. That's what really matters. Your heart. So we exist as a church to renovate that heart. You know, maybe responding correctly to, you know, the prejudice is what helped form this next quality in David, humility. Like I said, David was a worship leader. You know, it's impossible to worship, let alone lead worship, arrogantly. You can't do it. The essence of worship is humility. That doesn't mean that you think less of yourself. Oh, I'm such a slime ball. No, it means you think of yourself less. And David definitely did that. He put himself at risk for the sake of other people, even for stupid sheep. But even though it's not thinking less of yourself, um, it is putting your worth in perspective. What I mean by that, Romans 12, three says it this way. It says, do not think more highly of yourself than you ought. Hmm? When when Saul offered uh, his daughter to David in marriage, He responded humbly. He's like, I'm not worthy to be the king's son-in-law. He didn't think too highly of himself. He didn't walk in there and go, that's right, I'm the giant killer. Give me the prettiest one, baby. I deserve it. No, he was humble. So come on, church, can we learn to live in that radical middle where we don't think lowly of ourselves, but we don't think we're the bee's knees either? Where the heck did that come from? <laughs> Something like my great grandma would say. The bee's knees. No, we, we don't think of ourselves that much, actually. If you don't think about yourself, you don't, you're not thinking good or bad of yourself. You're thinking of others. Come on. We put the needs of others before our own. Of course, we have to do that in a healthy way. I'm not saying don't have boundaries. and anything. That's, that's a whole other message. Um, sorry, I know I'm going late. Uh, the final thing that I want to point out about David, and this is probably the most important to this point that we're trying to make, is that David had the fear of the Lord. He could have killed Saul. In fact, a lot of people around him said, you should have killed Saul. You know, but he didn't, not because Saul didn't deserve it, but because he said, God, this is God's anointed. God put him there. God can take him out. And of course he did, didn't he? Over and over, we see that kind of response from David. You know, he just wanted to do, he he didn't do things unless he thought it was what God wanted him to do. That is the core of, of what I'm talking about. That is precisely why God rejected Saul and chose David, because Saul stopped doing what God told him to do. He started living for himself and for what worked for him. But David was made king because he obeyed God. Look at this passage. God himself testified concerning David. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Isn't that powerful? 
Doesn't that make you just want to get yourself aligned with the Lord and do what he wants you to do? Don't you want to want to do what God wants you to do? Yeah. That's where we're going to pick up next week because I went way over. Um, We're going to look at how David became a man after God's own heart. So let me close with this. Life in the spirit means that we keep step with the will of God. That's the point. Being a follower of Jesus means that we keep step with the will of God. And at times that means we sacrifice what we want for God, for the greater good, for others in a good, godly, balanced, healthy way. But we do that. And Jesus was the ultimate example of that, wasn't he? Laid down his life. Let himself be tortured when he didn't have to let himself be tortured. So since it's the first Sunday of the month, we like to remember that sacrifice and celebrate communion together. So that's what we're going to do. We have four uh, stations with our, um, what I like to call COVID-friendly communion packs. Two at the tables up here, one back by that door and one back right there. They're real easy to find. So why don't you all go ahead, grab one of those kits, bring it back to your seat, and we'll participate together. By the way, this is open communion. You don't have to be a member. A member of Renovate means you come all the time. You are willing and able. You can go ahead and help yourself. If you don't follow Jesus or you're walking in unforgiveness, probably not a good idea. Otherwise, everybody can participate. Lord, thank you for the story of David. So inspiring, God. Help it to inspire us to be better than before, better than we even are now, to continually go from glory to glory to get better and better. And Lord, we remember you We remember your example of self-sacrifice. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he broke it and given thanks for it, he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Don't miss next week. It is going to be an exciting culmination to this message. Uh, If you're able, stick around and have a real communion with us, a meal. We pray. We talk. It's not weird. It's awesome. Stick around if you can. God bless you. We're dismissed.